was not a huge fan of him. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you here today. And I would uh, like to add my thanks, as I think we would all uh, like to, to a number of people who uh, made this possible. First, to the Oxford County uh, Republican Committee, and uh, Michelle Frank and Nancy Hansen, who uh, did Yeoman's work in uh, putting this together and uh, getting all eight candidates here. Justin Gilbert, who's way in the back there with the video camera, uh, freshman at Telstar, uh, and this will be uh, videotaped and will be shown over our local access uh, channel, channel four in Bethel. So you're speaking not only to the people assembled here, candidates, but to a multitude of others who will be watching at a later date. I'd also like to thank the Bethel Inn for uh, uh, the use of their uh, fine facilities here for this uh, debate. And lastly, to thank all eight Republican candidates for governor. Uh, to interrupt their hectic schedule, uh, it is uh, above and beyond. I, I, I know just running for, for uh, a house seat is only a small part of Maine. Uh, to run a, a campaign for the whole state uh, is, to me, anyway, mind-boggling. And we certainly uh, appreciate their effort to, to be here and the time that they uh, take to answer your questions. The format will be as follows. There will be a series of questions to the candidates by me. Uh, these are some of them very quick, uh, simple yes or no answers. Uh, in fact, we won't uh, uh, even uh, let them speak if they don't want to. All they have to do is raise their hand if they vote yes or, uh, or no, uh, depending on how the question is uh, phrased. Uh, there will be a couple of uh, short no answer chance. questions, and then we will throw it open to the public. Uh, I would ask you to make sure that your uh, question is on one topic. Uh, don't ask a broad question. Try to be as specific as you can, because we will hold answers to a minute or less. Uh, and then, of course, throw it open and direct it. You may direct it to any one of the candidates uh, that you wish. We will have, uh, if there are other candidates who want to respond uh, in kind, they will have uh, less than a minute to do that. Then at the end of the uh, session, each candidate will be uh, given uh, an opportunity to sum up uh, three, four minutes, uh, depending on the time. And these will be chosen by a drawing of the order in which they uh, will speak. And if I could have uh, my assistant, Vanna. <laughs> I won't call her Vanna. Uh, but but uh, I wanted more sequins if I was going to call Vanna. <laughs> no, no, no. You just go right down and let them pick. Oh, they pick. Yeah. Go right down. Oh, I get you, Mary. You get to pick a card. I can't remember so many. They're it's all like gambling. the lottery, right? That's right. Hey, no gambling. <clears throat> No casino, just a lottery. And if you can tell me the uh, number that you drew, Mary. You drew one again. Two. It's fixed. Summer? Seven. Seven. Pam? Three. Three. Charlie? Queen of Hearts? Six. Six. One. One. Jack? Five. Five. Jack's and Judy? Eight. Eight. And Paul must be the other one, which is four. Zero. <laughs> okay. That will be the order in which uh, they will uh, sum up at the end. Okay. This is a yes-no question. Do you favor casino gambling in Maine? If you do, raise your hand. In Calis only. Okay. <laughs> Adam, Colin... Yeah. Okay. Second question. Do you favor the direct election of the members of the PUC? If you uh, do, raise your hand. Direct election of the members of the PUC. 
Okay. If there's nothing on the chart up here, that's a no. Do you, this is the third one, do you favor establishing the position of lieutenant governor? Yeah, under some circumstances. Well, mm -hmm. don't, don't say anything. Just, <laughs> uh, let me list. Okay. Number four, do you favor extending the operating license of Maine Yankee beyond its scheduled closing date if approved by the uh, NRC? Adams, Boss, and Young. A kill. And kill. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Young. Boss. Number five. Do you favor combining work, the land use regulation uh, commission, with DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection? Okay. Everybody's agreed on that. The sixth question, do you favor privatization of the Department of Transportation? Parkway. Everybody. Everybody. No, <laughs> a parkway is a, is a yes. Parkway is a these yes. These are so yes and no questions. Yeah, these are not yes and no. Everybody but you. No. I never yeah. spent a lot of time thinking. Okay, in, uh, at your plate, there is a small yellow piece of paper. In your administration, rank in order from one to five, one being the most important, the following economy, education, entitlements, environment, and health care. Just go right down the line, one to five. Put a number at each. No ties. Would have put you on the spot. like going to school. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> How many of you favor a tax increase? That's kind of the answer I expected. Okay, assuming that you, uh, how many of you favor decreasing taxes? Again, what we all expected. <laughs> On your, your yellow sheet of paper there, there are three taxes, income, sales, and property. Rank them one to three as the one you would hit to first to reduce or you think is the most important in your administration to reduce. And rank them one to three. Again, no ties. While they're doing that, I, I forgot to uh, actually introduce our candidates. <laughs> I mean, as far as you people know, there could be anybody sitting up here. But uh, I think from the literature you found uh, at your seats, uh, you'll have no uh, uh, difficulty knowing who is who, particularly because they have name tags in front of them. Uh, we'll start at this end. Mary Adams uh, from Dover Foxcroft in Piscataquis County. County. Uh, she uh, is married, has two adult children, and is a grandmother. And uh, she, her claim to fame uh, by many people is that she got rid of uh, a tax, the uniform uh, property tax. Uh, she served on the State Board of Education and uh, is currently serving her 20th consecutive year on the uh, Garland Republican Committee Town Chairman. Sumner Lippman is a representative uh, representing uh, part of Augusta, uh, serving his second term in the uh, House. He is a uh, lawyer, uh, has established a couple of banks in Maine, uh, and done a number of other things that um, 
I'm sure he will uh, allude to uh, as time goes on. Next to uh, Sumner is Pam Cahill from Woolwich, Maine. Good. Uh, she's a mother of two, uh, and uh, she is a small business uh, owner running a, a tree farm. Um, she was elected to the state house and now serves in the Senate and serves as the uh, minority leader in the Senate. Charlie Webster is from Farmington, Maine. Uh, he owns a uh, business, uh, heating uh, and uh, <coughs> furnace business. And he also served in the Senate and uh, in uh, previous legislatures uh, was the uh, Republican uh, minority leader. Susan Collins is from Standish, Maine. She has served as a, uh, the New England administrator for the Small Business Administration. And in Governor McKernan's uh, administration, she was the commissioner of professional and financial uh, regulation. Uh, she also worked uh, for Bill Cohen in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and she was uh, born in Arusta County, or the county. Jack Wyman has served in the state legislature uh, and has been, of course, a statewide advocate for the uh, Christian Civic League. And he, with his wife Beth, have three daughters. Judy Boss is representative from Yarmouth, served 10 years in the main house, uh, currently serving on the Appropriations Committee. And uh, she and her husband uh, run a small family business, and they have three children. Paul Young, serving his first term in the legislature, representing Limestone. He's a native of Arista County, a uh, business owner of North Star Technologies of Limestone. He also teaches ethics and philosophy at St. Joseph's College in Wyndham. Now, if uh, my assistant will collect the yellow sheets of paper and, and then uh, enter those uh, on the, the board here. When will we get out? If we go on Monday? Get out. I think oh. Tuesday night. Tomorrow morning. We lose four people on Thursday. A very brief answer to the following question. Once elected governor, on what basis would you select the members of your administration? And we'll start, uh, we'll start with uh, Mary Adams. Yeah. You, you may want to use the uh, microphone. <laughs> My positions will be very clear if I'm elected governor. And I will select people um, in my... Can't hear? They can't hear, Mary. Speak up. If I'm elected governor of Maine, my positions will be very clear, and the people I bring with me will reflect my position. That's the only fair way to bring an administration in which reflects the will of the people. Sumner? I thought when Mary said that I was going to have a job because in the past she's always said <laughs> that uh, when she becomes governor, she's going to make the rest of us her cabinet. Uh, <laughs> it's because you're all smart. <laughs> I, it would be my intention as governor to obviously pick the most capable people available. However, what I would want to do is meet with industry and discuss with them the type of people that could work with them and understand their problems so that we could run government that would be friendly with business and industry, and especially the small business person. Uh, I would want to find out from them uh, who they feel comfortable with. Not let them name the person, but I certainly would want to review my picks with the people of the state of Maine and then put the most capable people in the position. Thank you. 
Pam? I would look for individuals who shared some of the common themes in my campaign, um, that of being, I pride myself in having a lot of common sense, being a straightforward individual, and I would give a priority to Maine people. I think all too often we look outside the state of Maine when we have good and qualified people in Maine. I would also look for people uh, that have a good, strong, scientific background in areas uh, that require scientific uh, research. Oftentimes we allow uh, laws to happen, policy to be made on emotion, and I don't believe that should happen. I th think we should use uh, a strong scientific uh, background. Charlie? Thank you. I'm of the opinion, first of all, that there are plenty of qualified Maine people to fill the position of cabinet and uh, administration, and I would, uh, I would have that as being a very important part of uh, my philosophy. As I'm campaigning throughout the state, I tell uh, people that as important who the governor is, is who the governor will, will bring with them. And, uh, you know, we, we, I can assure you of one thing, that once I become governor, no people will serve in the cabinet like Dean Marriott. We'll put people in the commission, in, as commissioners who, who think like the governor, who has a ba have basic views of what government ought to do, similar to the governor, and uh, that would be my goal and charge. Okay, Susan? Thank you. In my administration, job creation and preservation are going to be the number one priority for everyone who is in my administration. So I would look for people who share that very strong commitment. And I would also look for people who have a proven track record as effective leaders and managers. We would not have had a lot of the problems that we have seen in state government in the last few years if we had had people with executive experience and with strong management backgrounds. So I want people who share my mission and who also have the tools to make sure that it's carried out. Okay. Uh, first of all, Al, I, uh, I would appoint new people to my administration. Uh, secondly, because I have outlined a very bold and audacious agenda, I would want and will insist on hiring bold and creative innovators to be in my cabinet. People with new ideas, people with courage, tenacity, and perseverance, and original thinking. Secondly, or thirdly, I should say, I want people with a wide variety of backgrounds. And I want people with integrity. And I would like to find people with some real life experience to uh, work in my administration. And finally, I have uh, pledged, uh, among 33 other specific objectives that I outlined more than two months ago, in the economic area and then address at Bates College. I said it to black and white, which is a dangerous thing, but I did it. Because I wanted the people to know what exactly what my specific plans were if I became governor, is uh, that I would establish a uh, cabinet level 15 member council of economic advisors made up of businessmen and women uh, representing every segment of Maine's of business and industry community. I think for too long, Jack, the people affected by our decisions have been. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, obviously, competence and experience matter, but I think it's critical that we bring people with private sector experience um, who are loyal to me as a governor, who share the same common theme, and who do not work to promote each of their own departments. I think. Um, for those of us with experience in government, too often there is a fourth level of, uh, or fourth branch of government, the bureaucracy, that tends to protect its own turf at the expense of the common goals. And I think uh, we need some strong leadership, not more bureaucrats uh, in Augusta. And lastly, Paul. Thank you. Uh, let, let me just give you four different departments that I think are going to be the most important in, in, as we head into the 21st century, and you can figure out sort of what's guiding my thinking. First of all, in the Department of Education, I think we're going to need someone who is set to priority on academics and not socialization, and also someone who's concerned to make sure that more of the money we spend actually makes it into the classrooms of Maine. In the Department of Human Services, and this is going to be a tough one, someone who's compassionate but also who understands that there's a bottom line involved with these things. Thirdly, the Department of Economic and Community Development, which I think is extraordinarily important. We need a first-rate international business developer with a proven track record there. And in DEP, I have a friend uh, who's a gravel pit owner. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and lies. Well, I can't promise him the job. I might invite him to uh, sit in on the interviews. But I think we're going to have to realize that DEP is going to have to come to stand for Department of Economic Protection as well as Environmental Protection at the same time. Thank you. And my last question, you have all emphatically said you would not raise taxes, you would lower them. My question, and we'll start with Paul and come back this way, is what have you done in that area of reducing taxes? Or what will you do? Well, uh, in the last session of the legislature, we had an enormous fight over taxes. We were at one point facing a, a Democrat majority which wanted not only the temporary taxes which had been put on in the 115th legislature, but also an additional 100 or so million dollars. Uh, Representative Foss will speak next, proposed a zero tax budget that would have retired all of the temporary taxes. A number of us, uh, many of us in the House supported that budget, came up with something like 52 votes, and the budget that we finally supported retired somewhere around $100 million in corporate and income tax surcharges in the last session of the legislature. I think we need to continue efforts to reduce taxes, and I think our next mark has to be that additional 1% on the sales tax. As Paul said, we did have a major confrontation last session. I thought it was very important to hold the line on that five cent sales tax, especially for areas like this which border New Hampshire, for the southern part of the state that loses a lot of its traffic and business to New Hampshire. Um, I did craft a budget that would have returned to the five cent and kept the promise to the main people that we had made. Uh, I felt it was important to hold the line and bring the Democrats along. Unfortunately, there was a, um, a negotiated agreement that did break faith and, and kept the six cent sales tax. It is important to take that off. But I also think, in order to send a signal to the job creators, both in and out of Maine, we need to look at the income tax. It is very high relative to the rest of the country. And if we do not address that, we will not be attracting jobs or keeping the jobs we have. In 1990 and 1991, faced with budget shortfalls, Maine state government, instead of uh, making the tough decisions to prioritize spending and cut spending, uh, chose to enact the biggest income tax increase in the history of the state of Maine. That was the first mistake. The second mistake was to make a very naive and I think politically foolish and misleading promise to make it temporary. Uh, and then uh, uh, we had the battle uh, which I was not uh, involved in terms of voting, but I did uh, make a very clear statement as head of the Christian Civic League of Maine uh, that uh, if it came down to a choice of either keeping that one cent sales tax on, which shouldn't probably have been placed on two years early, or uh, totally uh, gutting programs to help the mentally ill or the mentally retarded and the poor, that I would opt for retaining the sales tax. I have called for 30 percent across the board income tax cut. We have a tax problem in Maine because we have a spending problem in Maine. The reason that taxes are so high in Maine is we spend too much. So I believe we need to look at the budget, at the spending side of the equation first. We need to look at all of our taxes. Our taxes are too high and we rank in the top 10% in almost every tax that we have in Maine. I want to look at where we can get the most bang for our buck in our tax reductions. But I do think reducing the sales tax back to the five cents on the dollar is extremely important because a promise was made to the taxpayers of Maine. When I was head of the SBA, when I would go around New England and talk to people, the image of Maine as a high-tax state was everywhere. There is no doubt in my mind that it discourages the creation of new jobs in this state. We need to take a real hard look at the spending side so that we can have tax reduction. I'm going to spend a lot of time, I have spent a lot of time this campaign, I'm going to continue to spend as much time as I can talking about uh, differences between the candidates and frankly I'll be running on the record I have established in 14 years in Augusta while many politicians even some Republicans were advocating uh, spending and taxing and this mentality that government was going to be everything to everybody I was willing to stand alone every state in New England and in the country who raised taxes between 1986 and 1993 
as an economy that's in tough shape. Every single state in the country that lowered taxes or remained, kept taxes at the same level between 1986 and 1993 has a robust, booming economy. You don't have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to realize that when you raise taxes and take money out of people's pockets and redistribute the, gust, the money in Augusta, it isn't going to help anybody except Augusta. What we need to do is very simple. We need to do what Maine people do every day. We need to set priorities. When we go back, when the next governor's elected and is sworn in, it wouldn't matter to me whether we had every dime we needed. We should eliminate dozens of programs that have been passed in the last 10 years we didn't need, we couldn't afford, and the main taxpayer shouldn't be burdened to pay for. So I'm going to talk about my record, the record that I have established and I'm proud of, and I think it's a record most people may even agree with. Last year, I own stuff. Last year I voted to, along with most Republicans, uh, for a zero uh, tax increase budget. Unfortunately, that budget got only 15 votes, 15 Republican votes in the Senate. But I did later, we were later successful in getting the corporate tax uh, reduced and also having the surcharge reduced on the main income tax. I have been an advocate in the entire 14 years that I've served in the legislature on reducing property taxes. In fact, some of us in the legislature, and I'm one of those people, talked about property taxes and the problem they were placing on individuals f lo a long time before it was politically popular to do so. I remember in 1984 voting against an education reform package and someone walking up to me afterwards and saying, you're never going to get reelected because you're anti-education. And I said, I'm not anti-education. I'm very positive, very pro-education. But the problem is the program that we're passing is just passing the buck right onto the backs of the property tax. And 10 years ago, everyone thought I was a little bit foolish to say that. Now, um, unfortunately, I get the opportunity to say I told you so all too often. I supported uh, a week or so ago, it kind of is all into a blur right now, uh, at the legislature a 20 percent reduction in the income tax. I believe very strongly in reducing the income tax. And while this may have seemed a luxury a year or two ago, it's a necessity now. Seventeen states currently have proposals before their legislatures to reduce the income tax, including Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. So it's no longer a luxury for us to reduce the in income tax. It's a necessity if we are to compete with states um, uh, in, our, in our vicinity, our northeast vicinity. Thank you, Pam. One of the advantages you have at the end of the line, you've heard everything that's said before you, and this was the disadvantage we had last time, but now Mary and I have the advantage of having heard the other answers. And I want to share with our listening audience a little bit different approach. Obviously, anyone who's going to cut taxes, the only way you're going to do it is reduce spending, but that doesn't answer the question. That just raises the question. The thing that we have to stop doing gimmicks, playing games. And that's what we see all the time going on. Gimmicks where there supposedly is a reduction in taxes, but all we're doing is refinancing debt and putting it off somewhere else. I firmly believe, and we talk about history, that when you come up with a tax reduction that takes away someone's pension, that's not a tax reduction and we're now paying the penalty of it because we have a constitutional amendment facing us. I believe that when you say you want to reduce taxes, you've got to say where well, you're going to reduce it. Well, I'll do that. I have fought for reduction of the size of the legislature from the day I started running. We have too many legislators. Our legislative budget was $4 million in 1981. Today it's $13.5 million. If we reduce the legislature one-third, we will save probably four to six million dollars. That's the type of savings that have to take place, is you have to take out a knife and cut. Where I believe that we sh of all taxes it should be reduced, number one, I think the property tax has got to come down because there's no relationship between the property tax and income. The second reduction would be in the income tax and the third in the sales tax. And finally, the one thing I would not do, which has been done in the past, is I would not cut economic development funds. I would not cut money that's spent on tourism. Because what you're doing then is shutting off the engines to the economy. And we need a, an economy moving ahead if we're to generate revenues. Thank you.
Pam cites that 1984, when she became involved with the property tax, I can cite 1976, when I became involved with the property tax, or rather 1975, I think. I'm the only candidate here who has actually gotten rid of a tax. And if you don't remember me for anything else, remember me for that. A lot of people talk, but I've done the walk. I have gotten rid of a tax. And since it was repealed, the state property tax, by referendum vote, many of you may have voted to get rid of it, um, it has saved conservatively $270 million. So while they're talking four to six to eight or $10 million, remember that. In 17 years, I personally have saved you $270 million. Plus, I got you out of an awful situation where the legislature set the rate on local property tax, something that Sumner tried to get you back into in 1991 with a constitutional proposal which would have embedded a state property tax in the main constitution and taken away virtually all local control within a town. I also brought with me about 25 copies of something that was faxed to me from Washington yesterday showing the tax burden in Maine versus New Hampshire. I'm always interested what our neighbor next door is doing because, you know, the road runs up here and people can turn off before they get to Kittery. And the, in the property tax area, uh, Maine uh, excuse me, in the, in the all tax revenue area, Maine is 10th uh, and, excuse me, 13th in the nation as a percentage of personal income. That means the tax burden in, re in relation to what people are actually earning. We are 13th in the whole nation. This is why we're feeling the pinch now. Our neighbor in New Hampshire is 50th. And we cannot ignore it. The state has been ignoring the reality. And this is why I am in this race. I don't think anybody from the grassroots who has watched what happens is going to be as nonchalant in this race as the rest of the people who are there. They've been at the state level looking down. I've been at the bottom looking up, and I'm panicked over it, and I think a lot of people have panicked over it because they're worried about their own security, whether or not they can take care of themselves in their old age, and whether or not they can hang on to their home. This is why I'm here. I'm not here because I've made a lifetime of this. I've never t earned a nickel from my political involvement in the last 20 years. I've never been paid for anything I've done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now we want to open it up for questions. I would ask that you would stand, be recognized, state clearly and loudly your name and where, what town you are from, and then ask your question. Again, I would, I would urge you to try to make your question as specific as possible so that it can be answered in a very short manner of, uh, you know, seconds or a minute. And then you may direct that, if you wish, to, to everyone or specifically to one individual that sits before you. Yes? From the Burgess, Bethel, retired. My question relates to the economy and jobs and what you have spoken about, the friendliness of the legislature and our laws and stuff to this. My question is, uh, first, a statement. I know from a fact, and I read in the paper every day, and I've read in the paper every day for 10, 20 years, Maine is not a friendly state to business, whether it's a small logging firm, a sawmill, or a paper company. Question. I would like everyone to respond just one simple little thing that they think that can happen to help us out in this idea. Will, Judy? Yes, I, I, you have, uh, I think you've captured the entire problem we have. We have a, a mindset in Augusta. Uh, sorry. 
We have a mindset in Augusta that is anti-jobs, anti-business, and is, has created a, um, a we against them attitude from both, uh, from all branches, as a matter of fact, government. And I think it's time we change that, and I think there are very specific things to do. I think cutting taxes is one. The competitive advantage to Maine is clear if we can cut our tax rate. Uh, clearly, workers' comp, we're beginning to see some change, and more needs to be done. I don't think it should be opened up now, because until we can change the makeup of the legislature, because now, if it were opened up, we'd regress, because there are tremendous forces. We need to address the cost of power in this state. We need to have a proactive, forceful attitude in Augusta that works with the job creators, not against them. Uh, you, can <laughs> you can follow me. We always do AIDS before beauty. Uh, but uh, let me say, Mr. Burgess, that uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the hallway out here at my table, I didn't burden the chairs with this, but uh, there is uh, a lengthy and very specific uh, program that I've outlined for economic renewal in Maine. It's entitled Opportunity, Growth, and Jobs Restoring Maine's Economy. And the centerpiece of my plan is a 30% across the board income tax cut to be enacted over four years to be paid for with a 20% reduction in the size of state government over that same four-year period and across the board freeze on hiring a thorough and independent performance audit of state government. One thing that I think all of us at this table agree with that I think separates us very distinctly from the other party is that we believe that it is business and not government that creates jobs for the working men and women of this state. I think that is a major philosophical difference. And we must start with cutting taxes because state government is too big, it spends too much money, and taxes are too high. And we all have talked about that. I propose specifically doing something about it. Now, sit. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Burgess, your question, uh, I think as you'll find out, or maybe the numbers have been tabulated, is everybody's first priority here that uh, is running for governor as a Republican. I think that everyone would also agree that the surest economic development policy is to have a robust, thriving private sector. And you need to do all the things that both of the previous speakers have talked about in order to ensure that you have that private sector. Government doesn't create jobs, businesses create jobs. Government helps create the conditions in which those businesses can create those jobs. And one final point that I think is very important, for too long in our state we have ignored traditional industries that used to be the mainstay of Maine's economy. I come from an agricultural area in Aroostook County. Uh, our fisheries, our timber products, and our paper industry. These things aren't glamorous. They're not the kinds of things that grab the headlines, that, uh, you know, governor travels far away to bring all kinds of exotic things. But they're also things that don't go up and down with the business cycle. And I think if we focus more on some of those traditional industries, we can have an economic revival in this state in the 21st century. Thank you. I, too, have an economic plan, and it contains very specific proposals aimed at helping to promote business, particularly small business. I think we need to expand access to credit. I think we need to reform the environmental permitting system. And I believe we need to promote new markets for Maine products, services, and tourism. I have a lot of specifics that I'll talk about in my closing uh, remarks, but just one final point, And that is I have a proven track record in helping business. As the head of SBA, I doubled the amount of small business loans in New England. Thank you. Mr. Burgess, if you asked uh, every if you asked all the Democrats this question and, and the independents and all the fringe candidates, they'd all give you the same answer. And what I tell people is you, you folks here today and the people in the state of Maine have a job to do, and that is to look through all the haze and look at the candidates running and see whether what they're telling you today is what they believed in yesterday. That's very important. During the 80s, when I was in the Senate, arguing against some of the most anti-business, regulatory, crazy laws ever passed, they were passing. And I was fighting the fight and losing. And it's been very frustrating for those of us who run a business in Maine, and I'm one of them, who pay workers' comp, and I'm one of them, pay liability insurance and mass social security and all the costs of doing business here in Maine, to watch what's happened to the state. But some of us have been fighting the good fight. There are some things we can do. We can exempt some small businesses from workers' comp. I believe we can do that. There are some other things we do. We have a plan. We all have a plan here about how to change things. But it's frustrating to me because even 
the most liberal candidate on the ballot today in the fall will tell you which one here. And the job you have is to find out whether what they're telling you today is what they believed yesterday. That'll tell you where they're going to go tomorrow. Thank you. Mis Mr. Burgess, you hit the nail right on the head. Our regulator regulatory climate in Maine is an absolute mess. And every day, in subtle and not so subtle ways, we're taking away properties, landowner rights. Wherever I go, someone has a horror story about the stranglehold that DEP has around the necks of businesses and individuals, and it's got to stop. And I believe my record of 14 years in the legislature will prove that uh, as a candidate, as a legislator, and as your governor, I would put a stop to that immediately. And the best thing you can do, you have something you can do, and that is elect more Republicans to the legislature. We have, uh, you've done a good job here in Oxford County, but we need more common sense people, people that have worked for a living and know what it's like to work for a living. And it's it's time that this attitude stop, and the best thing we can do is elect an, a Republican governor and a legislature who uh, knows what it is to work for a living. Thank you. I'm particularly excited to know that there's another Sumner in a room. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't happen very often. Uh, <clears throat> I've started many small businesses, and I, and I understand exactly what you're talking about. And that's why when I answer, answered a previous question, I said that I'm going to go to business and enterprise and I'm going to the small business people, and when I put people in government in my cabinet, I'm going to have people in there who have had business experience and understand what the business person is talking about. That makes a great deal of difference. And very briefly, Sumner, from one Sumner to another, there are four things that got to be fixed. One is workers' comp. It's broken. It costs too much. Two is electric rates. Three is permitting. And four is our taxes. Thank you. Lastly, Mary. Have you ever heard of a gardener that loved the pot more than the plant? <laughs> well, this is what's happened, and I'm really angry about it. We've been taken over by radical environmentalists who love the land more than the people, who, don't, who, who, who uh, love the air, but they can't stand free enterprise. They love the pot, but they don't like the flower. They've never made the connection. I don't know what's wrong with their heads, but if you knew what's down there getting paid to lobby the legislature, you would be in shock, as I have been, as I have watched it. The, as a result, the state now is, is a state where we have crybaby labor unions and crybaby capitalists. And I would keep in mind, if I were governor, what the real function of government is. It's to provide health and safety for the citizens. And it also, in the area of industrial development and business development, can darn well get out of the way because they are creating a whole layer of crybaby capitalists out of people who would be creative entrepreneurs working with creative banks, but the state and the federal government gets in, in the middle with their federal grants and their bureaucrats, and that, coupled with the environmentalists, has created a mess that has made me so mad I'm running for governor. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Other questions? <laughs> um, I'm concerned about, concerned about education because the, um, the portion of funding from the state has dropped for quite a while until it's, it's in a very dangerous situation where more money has to come from property tax. And I think everyone agrees that property tax is not the best way to fund education, but I hear, I think all of you saying that you would cut um, other taxes state tax by up to 30 percent. I believe that's important for business, um, but that's down the road where it would help business. And meanwhile, education would be caught in a crunch again. And I don't hear any good way of funding education. You can't just drop away all the money. Education is the job of government. It isn't anybody else's job. 
and I'd like to hear how you will provide leadership for education, and that includes the funding. And Mr. Young, I also believe that academics is important, but if you were in the schools, you would know that the socialization is just as important as academics. I mean, uh, again, if I may, uh, Al, uh, with answering that, and I presume we all are going to want to answer it. Uh, I'm not sure that the answer uh, to our problem uh, with education in Maine is that we need to spend uh, more money than we're spending. I think, first of all, we need to look at how we're spending the money we're spending. For example, the 210,000 young people in the public school system, K through 12, we're spending over $100 million on the administration of that public school system. And that factors out to be close to $500 per student per year. Now, I will seek to reverse or the inverted pyramid. We have an inverted pyramid right now where the most important people in our educational system are the bureaucrats and the administrators, and then the teachers are under that, and the parents are under that, and the children are last. Under my educational policy, we're going to have uh, the priority of putting main children first, and the only special interest we're going to have in education is going to be our children. I think if we do that, look at how we're spending money, we can make cuts in educational bureaucracy and administration and still do better by our young people. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, you're right. You can't, people think you can't do both. I think you can do both. We need to cut levels of state taxes. But that does not mean an automatic shift to the property tax, because I do think education should be one of the top priorities of the state. And you can rearrange your state budget to put your money where your important issues are. Last year, and it was discussed earlier, crafting a, an alternative budget. There was a major commitment in that budget to general purpose aid education. I think it's an absolute function of government to take care of, especially K-12, and certainly uh, post-secondary to a degree. But I also uh, believe strongly in local control of education. I don't think the decisions are made better in Augusta. I think there are, there are efficiencies that should be achieved at the local level. I think direction should be given from Augusta, but I think the funding decisions are best made closest to the kids, which is in the classroom and the local schools. There have been huge increases in the amount the state has put, even though the percentage of the state budget is smaller, there's been a lot more money put into education, and I think it's remained a top priority. But the issue, welfare is quickly taking a larger and larger piece, and I'll Talk about that, please. <laughs> Thank you. It, uh, it is great to have so many women in the race, especially now that, that Mary's joined us, because now when we go to dances, there are as many, as many guys as there are girls. And it's, uh, it's a lot easier. Um, you haven't been to the dances yet, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to. Don't dance around the question. <laughs> <laughs> Judy's exactly correct. We fought very hard for GPA money in last year's budget, uh, in the biennial budget, and largely through Judy's efforts and the efforts of the Republicans uh, in our Republican caucus, we've been able to add another three million, I believe, in this uh, supplemental budget to what the government proposed additional, so four million more dollars to GPA. We've always fought for, for that and to relieve that property tax burden, because you're right, the taxes are like prairie dogs. You push them down over here, and they they pop up somewhere else, and that's what the property tax. Let me just say briefly on the socialization issue. What I meant to say was, I think that there are problems that we're trying to deal with, that we're forcing teachers to deal with in our school system, which is distracting them from their primary role of teaching that could be handled in other systems. And we ought not to put all of that burden on the educational system, because it distracts, I think, from the value of the education, and we're really not paying our bill for, for those other kinds of problems that, that maybe need to be handled in other service delivery areas. You have raised a very good point because about 40% of the state budget goes for education. And I think that candidates who are proposing immediate and very deep tax cuts have an obligation to spell out to you exactly how they're going to get there without harming education. We do spend over a billion dollars a year on education in this state when you combine the local and the state share. And I think that's appropriate because it's so important to the future of our economy and to the future of the, of the people who live in this state. I, 
as I have traveled around, the complaint that I hear most often about the formula is the huge swings from year to year. And I believe that we need to alter the formula in a way that we have a cushion so that we don't have these dramatic ups and downs that place such huge pressures on communities and on school systems. I also think that we do need to look at how the money is being spent. The local uh, school boards and the communities need to look at how the money is being spent. A sister of mine has taught in Western Maine for a couple of years and finally quit in frustration after finishing the school year because as an English teacher, she did not have books for her students. She had to spend her own money to buy books for her students. And there's something wrong when we're spending over a billion dollars on education each year and an English teacher does not have books for her students. Charlie? Thank you. I think, without question, the most important function of government is educate, educate kids. That's what government's all about. The problem the politicians in Augusta seem to have, and I find it very frustrating, is that no one wants to set priorities. In 12 years, we've gone from 28th in the country in welfare spending to number three. It seems to me that we ought to be able to look at how we spend our dollars and see whether that's where we want our money going. Government can't be everything to everybody. The people in this, in this state who are most offended by our welfare state are people working for welfare wages. I mean, many people in this state would be better off sitting home on a government program that would be working. And we need to look at those programs and decide whether that's where our money ought to go. We ought to set priorities. You know, my car is paid for. If I want to buy a new car, I have to decide what I'm going to do away with it. It's that simple. We have, you know, I have to set priorities. Our government needs to do that too. If we can fund education appropriately, there are some things we can do. We can look at, we must look at the administrative costs. They're too high. We need to look, to look at other areas. But we can pay for education by simply deciding where our money ought to be best spent. And, and paying young women to sit home, in my opinion, Amen. And men, well, whoever, people who are sitting at home on a government program, men or women, thank you, Senator, it's not appropriate. What we should be doing is spending our money uh, where it's best spent, and that is educating kids at all levels. Well, I think you see by uh, the chart on the wall that education and the economy are number one and two, number two uh, concerns of all the candidates, all the Republican candidates running for governor. And they're not mutually exclusive. I think that if we improve our economy, we have more people working, more people paying taxes, and there's obviously going to be more money for education. That's why I support reducing the income tax so that we can encourage more businesses to come into the state of Maine. Uh, but I want to tell you about a little program or a little problem that's happening in Augusta as we speak. There's a, a bill before the legislature, an investment tax credit bill for paper companies to help them expand, do some environmental cleanup and that sort of thing. Um, the labor unions got an amendment stuck on that that also included strike breakers, that they were going to exclude strike breakers from, from that particular piece of legislation. The Democrats negotiated that off and said, if you'll take off strike breakers, we'll put money, we'll take some of that investment tax credit out uh, of that program for the paper companies and fund the main health care program. It's about $1.4 million. My response was, if there's $1.4 million kicking around anywhere, it has to go to education, and that's my priority. We're spending a, a billion dollars, a year, over a billion dollars a year on education. We're spending 40% of our state budget on education. And I, as a candidate, have stayed away from promising 30%, 20% or even 10% tax cuts for that simple reason that you're going to end up with a tax shift. Because if you make a commitment for a tax cut and 40% of your budget is education, there's a good chance you're going to end up with a higher either cutting education or you're going to end up with more pressure on the property tax. I put down on the blackboard that number one priority in reduction of taxes to me is property tax. It's got to come down. I think that we totally depend upon that, for, and, and, and it's, we've got to do something. The solution, and I, uh, I have to pursue this, is the solution to our economic recovery is really education. We have got to be able to pour more money, not less money, into the main technical college system. That we have to be able to educate the students today, and it isn't necessarily we need to put mo more money in K through 12. We've got to change the way we're doing it somewhat. But I certainly don't think that we want to cut education, and I've indicated I won't cut education. I believe we've got to emphasize more math, reading, mathematics, uh, some of the basic studies. Uh, but I am committed that education is our future and the children are our future. Thank you. The children are our future. 
everybody's absolutely right about that. I've watched this so long that it, I lose patience with it. After we feel the state property tax, Governor Longley put me on the State Board of Education. I remember Governor Longley, that wasn't all that long ago. He had the first billion dollar state budget. Now, the entire school budget for K through 12 is equals one billion, what state government used to be. All the studies show that more money for education does not give you better results. So why is everybody taxing themselves out of their homes for something which is not going, according to the studies, going to benefit children. I'm terribly impatient with the whole schmear of school funding. I came into this in 1974 during the first year of the present school funding law when it changed. And I've watched this thing eat everybody out of house and home, which was exactly what we predicted it was going to do when they passed it. If I had my way about it, we would have repealed this along with the state property tax, but it was hard enough to get rid of the tax, let alone the school funding law. When I was on the state board, I specifically said, what is education? The nine of us sat there, and including the commissioner, and do you know that this is serious? They did not know. If you ask the legislature, they do not know what it is. Now, even a tea bag tells you that if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. They don't know where they're going, and, any, and the road to hell has gotten us where we are almost in bankruptcy. Now, this state is on the verge of bankruptcy, and for everybody to sit around and think they can patch and talk about education that more money's going to make any difference, they're just blowing hot air. <laughs> And if I'm governor, you're going to hear a lot about this, and we're going to get a handle on it, and the kids are going to find out how to read. Thank you. Merton? Uh, well, I'd like to, I'm Merton Brown uh, from Bethel. I'm a, a member of our local 17-member school board. I'm also uh, the town clerk and the property tax collector. <laughs> <laughs> various programs that have started with suggestions that I've heard uh, that simply haven't worked and, and maybe won't work. I'm wondering if each of you could tell us something that you might be able to do that would uh, help that uh, shift of that property tax burden. Let's start at uh, this end of the table. Okay. Go ahead. What will make a difference in education and lower the property tax burden? Was that your question? Or what, what you would do to help lower that burden to the, top, to the property tax payer? There's a lot of things you could do if you could get the legislature to go along with it. Which is another reason everybody within listening range of this um, program, and I hope there'll be a lot of people watch it on that cable, is they got to elect Republicans to the legislature, because the governor can't make Democrats mind. <laughs> and, and there are several ways you could do it. You could even put a cap on local property taxes, which could be removed by a vote of the people, which would give them local control over it. But it would keep them from being scunned to death by the local superintendent. I, I think that number one, the, the formula really isn't a formula anymore. Formula is gone, and what they do is they tinker and tanker until we can get out of there. The second thing that we can do is that we can give you a decision before uh, July 1st, so that the, one of the major problems the districts are having is that they don't get a decision until it's too late and they've already made a commitment. Uh, to be more specific as to how we can reduce the property tax, I see abuses going in my community, and I've tried to do something as a legislator totally unsuccessfully with the nonprofits. Forty-eight percent of the real estate in our town is owned by nonprofits, which totally destroys our tax base. So that I think we have to take a look and see who's getting a free ride, and maybe they're not paying their share for services. You know, Mary, part about being governor is leadership, and it's, and it's uh, working with the legislature, not in necessarily against it. And I think uh, uh, part of the 
um, the dilemma that we've been in in the last few years is that the legislature and the executive branch of government have failed to get along. And I think it's time that we move away from that and decide uh, uh, that we are going to uh, work together for the good of all the citizens of the state of Maine. Unfunded mandates, of course, is the biggest problem that we have in the property tax. Some of us uh, at this table have worked uh, all of our lives political lives to get rid of unfunded ma mandates. We had a re resolution, I think, that Judy sponsored in the House the other day uh, to tell the federal government to wake up and start smelling the roses, uh, that we've done a good job uh, uh, alerting the state legislature or the state government to stop passing the burden down to the, pro to the local property tax. And now it's time for all of us to work with the federal government and tell them it's time uh, to stop passing the burden to the, to the state government. So that's one of the things that we can do as far as uh, uh, property tax is concerned. I remember in 1987 when, or 88, when the legislature passed a mandate on the municipalities requiring all salt piles to be, uh, have sheds built over them. I led the fight in the Senate and was attacked by the Natural Resource Council and every other environmental group the next election because I was against the environment. And I said in the debate that I felt common sense told us all that we ought to cover our salt sheds, but that unless the state of Maine was willing to pass a law requiring it, I guess probably we've been in the state for 150 years, we could probably last a few more years without having this law. During 1984, when the legislature passed the Education Reform Act, which cost the property tax pay payers in this state $21 million out of your po pocket, a mandate, another mandate, again and again without funding. You know, I've had a record of voting against these things. And I, and I, I, I think that the best way that we're going to get more, uh, be able to relieve any of the property taxes or, or any of these taxes we have in the state is to have a booming economy. And the way to do that is put people back to work, and that means changing laws. What we don't need in Maine, and I want to make this perfectly clear to anybody who wants to hear it, is we don't need a Band-Aid. We need radical surgery. And if that means, I agree with Senator uh, Cahill, we should work together with the legislature, but if it means confronting the legislature and standing up and being counted, that's what we have to do. Because I'm not convinced these guys in Augusta get it, guys. They just don't get it. And if we're going to change the laws of Maine, we're going to have to go over their head if that's what it takes to have the kind of laws in Maine that we need to make Maine a better place. As I think we all agree, unfunded mandates have been a problem. I'm thinking particularly at the federal level now, given the changes in Maine State, while you don't have the problem as much anymore, but you do have the cumulative impact of unfunded mandates in previous years. But to give you a specific example, I live in Standish right on Sebago Lake. And that is the source of Portland's water uh, supply, as you know. Due to the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, we are building a huge new water treatment plant. Now, people have been drinking the water out of Sebago Lake for how many decades? And it's been fine. But now there's a new federal mandate to filtrate the water that's adding enormous cost to the system that the ratepayers are going to have to bear. And that's an example of the kind of unfunded federal mandate that we need to uh, work against and try to get the same kind of protections at the federal level. With regard specifically to property taxes, though, in addition to the unfunded mandate issue, I would like to see the circuit breaker program revitalized. It did provide, when it was fully funded, a lot of relief to lower income and middle income people who had high property taxes. Unfortunately, it has been a victim of budget cuts in recent years, and I believe that was a very worthwhile program. Sir, first of all, you have my sympathies. Uh, secondly, there are several things that, uh, that we can do. Uh, one is we need to look at all sales tax exemptions. There are hundreds of millions of dollars of sales tax exemptions that need to be reviewed. Uh, as governor, I will call for that review. As a matter of fact, I'll conduct it. And uh, to see if there's some that we wouldn't propose for elimination. The tax this will give us revenue to fund uh, a property tax relief program. I, tax with all due respect to Susan, I'm not sure that the circuit breaker is the way to go. Uh, for years, I have felt that the more direct route and the simpler way to cut property taxes, if you were going to fund a program, a state program to do it, would be the homestead property tax exemption, which would exempt up front a certain valuation of one's principal place of residence so that they would not pay the property tax in the beginning rather than pay it and then have to wait weeks or possibly months to get rebated. Uh, the second thing, uh, the other thing that I will do, uh, Governor, is uh, uh, call for a review of uh, the mandates that took place before uh, the constitutional uh, 
uh, unfunded mandates amendment was enacted. Because there are many mandates that are still on the books that are not affected by that. Postpone all but the most essential of those. I think it's some of these mandates that are really uh, putting a stranglehold on local property tax. This is some of the things I would do. Well, there's a lot of, lot of uh, response to things. First of all, um, I, I agree with Susan that the circuit breaker is the best program because it targets it to those who need it most. And, uh, but we did revitalize it. In fact, we led the charge to put some more money back into it in this particular budget. Uh, and I think that's important because it does relieve the property tax. Clearly, the unfunded mandate, I'm glad everyone mentioned it because that's my issue. I sponsored the original bill in 1987 to force the state to not pass any more unfunded mandates on its main communities. Uh, that had a rocky a road to passage. The speaker was not at all happy with that idea. In fact, held it till the final night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, and ran it, uh, thinking that he would be able to hold his party in line. But the, the evidence is so compelling as to the damage being done, or that had been done to main communities that we were able to pass it by 94-38. I even remember the exact number <laughs> because those were hard-earned votes. Uh, that is, I've been relentless about that. And when uh, about a month ago, we were told when the Brady Bill passed, and whether or not you agree with the Brady Bill, it is an unfunded federal mandate that in order to comply with that federal law, it would cost us somewhere between four and $600,000, most of that cost being picked up by local law enforcement agencies. So when we had this bill after bill on how to uh, pay for this, I decided to write a letter to the Attorney General and ask him to file a suit against the federal government and say, if you want a mandate to the Brady Bill, you pay for it. And we will, we will do whatever you ask us to do as long as you provide us with the funds. He is in the, five other states have started a suit, and I said, we can, we can even save money and join forces. But it's critical that we stand up to the federal government now. Thank you. I, uh, I personally think that and disagree with my colleagues who claim that the income tax is, the, uh, is, is the, the most villainous tax that we have in our state. I think they're all a problem. Personally, I think the property tax is the tax which is the single most destructive of what we would call the traditional main way of life. It's destroying families' ability to own homes. It's destroying the ability of the elderly on fixed and sometimes uh, declining incomes. As Mary says, it's eating people out of their, out of their house and home. I also think that the property tax is destructive of economic development. If you think about farmers with their farms, woodlot owners, and people who own great forest lands. The reason that the property tax rates keep going up is there is no incentive on bureaucrats in Augusta and the legislature who pass educational mandates and then don't have to pay for them because that money has to be raised locally to pay for those mandates at local town meetings. And so what I'm going to propose as governor is an expanded, actually a, a revolutionized version of the, uh, the, uh, the circuit breaker program, a full-fledged property tax credit that would work just like an earned income tax credit on your tax form. You would look up your income, you would look up the amount of property tax that you could pay, you would get a certain number on there, 500, whatever it is, and that would be taken right off of, your, uh, off of the income tax that you pay. Now how do you fund that? I would do exactly similar to what the governor had proposed. I would cap state income tax revenues at $620 million. Uh, and uh, projecting some growth over the out years, and then I would take the revenue that you save from that to feed back into the property tax system. And that way, you're tying the hands of the government, which puts these mandates on top of you, by limiting every dollar that they make the towns pay, they're gonna lose in that property tax credit. The other thing you'll have to do, as Mary suggested, is you're going to have to have a cap on municipalities' ability to raise property taxes, or they'll just bleed the state dry, something like a Proposition 2 and a half from Massachusetts. It's complicated, but it's a complicated mess that we got ourselves into over a long number of years. I'm one of those people that got into government. I ran for government because Loring Air Force Base was closed back in my home district, and this state was unable to come to grips with the economic development problems we have here. I'm serious about facing these challenges and making these changes. Thank you. Okay, we said, uh, unfortunately, we said we would uh, stop at uh, 5 o'clock, and it's uh, rapidly approaching that. One last question. You'll have an opportunity to talk individually to uh, the candidates after they make their uh, summary. Bob, I'll hand over. To get on a different subject, uh, looking at the middle of the chart, 
most of you have rated entitlement number five of those five issues there. I would like to know what you would do to reduce the entitlement program in this state, thereby saving us money, as many of you have alluded to. I would like to know what you might propose to get these people out of the entitlements and back into the workforce. I would like an answer that would be more specific <laughs> in stimulating the economy and reducing the taxes. And about 30 second answers. <laughs> Uh, I originally sponsored the uh, Work Fair Aspire program several years ago. Unfortunately, it was watered down when it went through the legislative process, and it took out a lot. Of, there were a lot of exemptions into it. I believe in mandatory work for those who are able-bodied on welfare. We are fourth highest in the country in per capita cost of welfare. To bring us to the national average would save us tens of millions of dollars that we can put in other at higher priorities. I believe that you need to provide transitional services. It is so easy now to be on welfare that it's, it's, it's very hard to get off. And you need to train people and provide some of the savings for that. But I think it, it, it should be a, a, a very tough love kind of approach. You must do this because uh, we're, we're building generations and generations. Uh, of next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I believe that we've got to put incentives in the right direction, incentives for people to work rather than stay out of work. Uh, one of the greatest problems we have with our welfare or entitlement program is daycare. If it costs $125 a week for daycare and you can only make $150 a week, people aren't going to go to work. We've got to solve the daycare problem so that, so that it pays them to go to work and then we're going to have to tell them that they have to go to work. Okay, Jack? Our welfare system isn't working not for poor people, not for the taxpayers, not for our families. It's an anti-family, anti-work system. I will, as governor, petition the federal government for a waiver similar to one that Governor Thompson of Wisconsin requested and was granted to abolish the welfare system in Maine entirely and develop a brand new system based on a two-year program of uh, uh, job training, child care, other support for a two-year period with the idea that at the end of that two-year period, the welfare recipient would transition off of welfare into a job in the private sector. We must end generational dependence. But the only way we can do it is not reforming the current system, but abolishing it all together completely, developing a brand new system. Okay, Pam? Problem is that uh, the welfare mentality in the state has become a way of life, and that's the big problem that we have right now. I support uh, a work fair type project that uh, insists able bodied men and women work if they're able. I think that you do have to have some transitional support for these people, uh, transportation, child care, and, and some job training. Some of these people simply don't have the skills to go back to work. Well, first of all, we've got to recognize that we can't afford new entitlements. Specifically, we cannot afford a government-run, government-managed, and regulated universal coverage Clinton-style health plan, which would bleed even more of the resources that we have. And we have to make absolutely clear about that. I'm not one of these people who says, wait and see what comes from Washington, because what comes from Washington, you're going to be able, hopefully, to get wavered out of. And we've got to be very clear that maybe we support universal access, and we certainly don't support universal coverage, and we can't afford it. I also support with these work fair proposals. In the, uh, in the state of Oregon, where they uh, tested, piloted a full employment program, one of the things they found was when you require able-bodied recipients of the benefit to work for the benefit, half of the people don't show up for the benefit anymore. They just go away because they don't want to work. That's where you start to save some money in entitlements. Thank Charlie. I think what a frightening, a frightening statistic is that 50% of the people in the state who file an individual income tax return, and this is a fact, make less than $19,000. Half the people who file an income tax make less than $19,000. Those are statistics from the taxation department. Two third, uh, half the people in Maine who file a joint return make less than $38,000. Those are important statistics to remember because when you think, when anybody thinks we have to have a program where government's going to be doing more and more for people, we need to realize who's paying. I mean, that's what we have to remember. Who is paying? All of us support, I mean, I think reasonable people support some kind of workfare program. We need to have some kind of a system where people don't have an incentive to stay on the program. We shouldn't be paying people to, to have more children. I mean, let's be honest. You can count that, you can call me a hard nose, but people that I represent that are working in factories and driving uh, trucks and teaching school just don't want to see their taxpayers' money being used this way. 
As long as we do everything for everyone, they're going to expect it. We need to change our attitude. And Susan? We need to totally revamp our welfare system to end the corrosive impact of the system on the people who are in it, as well as to be fair to the people who are supporting it. I would follow the lead of states like New Jersey, Wisconsin, and Vermont, and establish an absolute time limit on the amount of time that an able-bodied person can receive welfare. But I would start from day one with working with the person with a plan to get the person back into the workforce. We also need to change the provisions of the program that encourage the breakup of the family. Did you know that if a teenage girl who is pregnant stays at home with her family, she doesn't get benefits. If she moves out into an apartment, she gets benefits. What kind of program is it with incentives like that? We need to totally revamp it and make it more logical with the goal of getting people to work. Well said. Now you know why I always congratulate all of them at the end, because they're very thoughtful people. Um, I talked to the selectman of our town the other day who administers the general assistance, and I asked him that, this question of what can be done at the local level. And he told me what it was like to administer welfare in a small town of a thousand people. And you can do the same thing in your own town if you're not the if, if you're not the uh, welfare um, giver, then you can talk to somebody who is. He said it would help if the federal programs were figured into the state programs of general assistance. Right now, fuel allow allowance and food stamps are not allowed to be considered uh, in determining eligibility for general assistance. He also said that it would be helpful if the um, person in charge of administering it would pay attention to who's getting it. Uh, if they say they're working um, part-time and they're working full-time, if they say they're not working and they are, then, then uh, they, should be, um, they should be subject to fraud. That is white-collar crime. We have people on welfare who are, in, in fact, they are never punished. They are suspended from the program. But in this world we have, in this country, we have equal protection under the Constitution. Why would you send a businessman to prison for fraud and you do not do the same thing to welfare people? This, they are just as equal as anybody else and to teach them and uh, treat, treat them differently is a, is a disservice and an insult to them. So he said, tighten up the aspect of dishonesty and punish it. Have some kind of punishment when they lie. And the other thing is very obvious if you live in a small town or if you live in a city, there are people living and having children out of wedlock when the man or the woman is working and they are not claiming them. It's happening right under everybody else's nose, but for some reason the welfare payments keep coming as though there's no other income. A lot of our problems is that we're not paying attention to what's going on. Okay, we're going to summarize now. Each uh, candidate will have three minutes, and I will hold you to it. And we'll start with Susan Collins. First, I want to thank the Oxford County Republicans and Al for uh, sponsoring this forum. I hope it's been very educational to you, and it's been fun for us. My top priority as governor would be to promote the growth and the prosperity and the startup of small business. And the reason why is that if we're serious about creating more jobs, we need to help our small businesses. They are going to create more than two thirds of the jobs of the future. Unfortunately, our state policies right now frequently go in the opposite direction. As I have traveled through the state during the past six months, I have been struck by the number of tales that I have heard of state decisions that defy economic logic and common sense. For example, I met with a businessman in Augusta who was expanding his warehouse. DEP required him to spend $16,000 on air admissions and traffic studies to get his permit. <laughs> now think about this. This is a warehouse at the end of a 200-foot dead-end road. It's not a retail store, the expansion of which might be expected to create more traffic. It's not a manufacturing plant that's belching pollution into the air perhaps explaining the need for an air admission study. It's a warehouse. 
That $16,000 could have been used to hire another worker, to increase wages for the current workers, or to provide better health care. Instead, because of the policies of state government, we forced that money to be used for an unproductive use. This must change. In my administration, I can promise you that job preservation and job creation is going to be at the top of the agenda of every state department. One minute. So that whenever a decision is made, whether it's building a new road, issuing an environmental regulation, or designing a health care plan, we will look at the impact on small business and the impact on jobs. I have a strong professional record in helping our small companies, but in addition, I have a personal commitment. My family has owned a small retail lumber business in Aroostook County for 150 years, and I'd like them to be around 150 years from now. Thank you very much. Second, Mary Adams. Get enough cord. <laughs> I'm going to leave this here. The, the, this is the synopsis of our tax picture in Maine, and some of you may like to take it back with you when you go. We have been overspending and overliving and overregulated now for a long, long time, and the chickens have come home to roost. That's the message that I'm giving you, and I also want to tell you that I don't see anybody up here as nice and as smart as they are who has ever gone against all the special interests, including the legislature, the state school board, the League of Women Voters, the National School Boards Association, the State School Superintendents Association, and every other living lobby I can remember, and won. I have a track record of being scared to death, but doing it anyway. When I did repeal of the state property tax, I wondered why we lost control over our property tax. What I was was a girl picking up the end of a dragon's tail. And as I followed it along, I discovered the dragon. It was every special interest that sucked any tax money out of that was my enemy. We could never get more than 50 people in the legislature to support repeal, and yet when the vote came, the people of Maine repealed it three to two. That's when I knew the legislature was out of touch with reality, and the reason is the special interests work on them. And all Sumner's plan, to, and, and everybody on here except Jack Wyman, wants to reduce the size of the legislature. Don't you let him do it. <laughs> because it makes it easier for the special interests to get at the legislature. It's not going to save any money. And look at New Hampshire. If you want to change the size, increase it and pay them 100 bucks a year. They won't stay around and foul up your life. That's how to save money in the state of Maine if you want to change the size of the legislature. But just remember, a smaller legislature means a larger urban area. Could it be because Sumner's from an urban area? But you watch what happens to the rural area where the common sense is. <laughs> anyway, if you, if you elect me in the primary, I think I'm the one to beat Angus King because I've got a bead on him. He's got a manager who is the biggest central planner in the state of Maine, Kay Rand. And I can't wait to come up against Angus and Joe Brennan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Al, and thank all of you for taking time out of your weekend to come and listen to all of us talk. We've got so that we're pretty used to each other, but it's, it's good to offer our uh, philosophies in front of uh, a new group. I think our next governor needs to be a strong and effective leader, and I have a proven track record on about leadership that I'm very proud of. That, combined with my small business experience, I believe is a winning combination for the state of Maine. 
I know the impact of the rules and regulations that we passed down from Augusta because I have to live by those rules and regulations. And I would disagree with you, Mary. I am a grassroots person. I've worked all my life in the state of Maine. I've worked with my heart and my head and my hands to make a living and make a better life for my family. And I will continue to do that as governor. I'm a common sense type of a person. I'm no nonsense, and, uh, and I'm very proud of that. It's um, traits that my family from Stockton Springs, Maine, taught me a long time ago. I'm going to work for economic diversification for the state of Maine, because I think that's really the biggest uh, uh, chance we have against future recessions in the state of Maine. I want to rethink Maine's geographical placement. When I was growing up, we used to think of ourselves as being really at the end of the geographic scale. But we're in a global marketplace now, and Maine really is right in the middle of our geographic scale. If you think about it, we're really just a hop, skip, and a jump from European markets and from the rest of the United States. And we need to take advantage of that and do a better job at promoting Maine people, Maine products, and Maine's lifestyle. I'll work for regulatory reform. I tell a story about a year or so ago, we were debating budget cuts in Augusta, and a woman walked up to me and said, don't you cut my welfare benefits. And I said, have you ever thought about getting a job? And she says, there aren't any jobs out there. The only jobs out there are waitress jobs, and that's beneath me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when I'm not working in the legislature, when I'm not growing Christmas trees, I work as a waitress. And I work damned hard to make a better life for my family and to pay this woman's welfare benefits. One and minute. that attitude offends me. And I hope it offends you, too. And it's time we changed. I want to return property rights to people that pay property taxes. I have a gentleman down in Georgetown, Maine. His dock went out last year, and DEP came down and told him he couldn't repair his dock. They find him $4,000 for repairing his dock. That's got to stop. We need to return the rights of property, tax, uh, property owners to the property uh, payers. I want to reduce crime. I don't want to do it by taking away people's constitutional rights to own firearms. I want to do it by being tough on crime. Not the, fr the second or third time someone commits a crime with a firearm, but the very first time. And finally, I'm running for governor because a year ago our daughter graduated from college and she moved away from the state of Maine. She decided to go to New York. And she says, I'm moving away from Maine, Mom, because I don't see a lot of opportunity for me in <coughs> Maine anymore. I'm running for governor because I want to assure that the next generation and the next generation and the next generation have plenty of opportunities in the state of Maine. Thank you. Next up is Paul Young. We all stand up now. We all have to. Uh, that's all right. I can just, I think everybody can hear me. Um, I'm sure you're all sitting out there listening to everyone speaking and say it's wondering how, you know, how you're going to decide. And I'm a little bit reminded of one of the first times we were all together and my mother was in the audience and afterwards I went up to her and I said, well, what did you think? And she said, well, it's kind of hard to decide who's best. <laughs> I don't want to leave you on a, uh, on a depressing note, but... When you're deciding which one of us is going to represent the Republican Party in the fall, I'd like you to think about this. If we are willing to have an economy like those we find in countries like Mexico or Indonesia and accept a lower standard of living and a lower quality of life, then we don't have to change a thing in this state. Just stay on the same road we're on. We're going to get there inevitably. But if we want to live and compete in a global super competitive economy with the Germans, the Danes, and the Swedes, and they are, in addition to New Hampshire and places like that, they are our new competitors, we are going to have to change everything, beginning with how we think about those who would govern us. I think if you look at my credentials, I have the best private sector credentials of anyone in this race on either party or among the independents. To make our government run better, we have to run it more like a business. Let me tell you briefly in the time I have left what some of my principles will be. First of all, everyone in government needs a mission. They need to understand clearly what it is we expect from them. Secondly, we need to define measurable ways of assessing the performance of that government. Right now, the only way we know we're done is when the money runs out. Thirdly, 
eliminate as much rule, regulation, and bureaucracy as you possibly can. And then, having said to the state service providers, the teachers, and everybody else in the system, it's up to you to figure out how to do the job. Think about teaching. We have tons of rules and regulations about how to do everything. We say almost nothing about the bottom line. Having said to them, it's up to you to figure out how to achieve the performance, support them in every way you can, and hold them accountable when they fail. That is a prescription for a high-performance government that will allow us to compete with New Hampshire, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. I believe in the future of this state. I believe I'm the person who can lead this state into the 21st century. And I ask you for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Al, for being a uh, firm but fair moderator today. And I want to also uh, thank Carl and Nancy uh, Hansen for putting this event together with the Oxford County Republicans and for all of you for being here. I should say that if any of you would like to further bend my ear after this program, uh, I've been told that some friends of mine, and I guess I have some here, are uh, holding a, a little informal get-together at the Gibson Room in the Bethel Inn which is right across the, the way I know Is that right? No. And when Governor uh, Christine Todd Whitman was running for that office in New Jersey, she promised the voters that she would seek to enact a 30% across the board income tax cut. A lot of people said, like you've heard today, it was unrealistic, it can't be done, it's too ambitious, it's too bold, all sorts of reasons why it wouldn't work. Well, Christine Todd Whitman was elected governor of New Jersey, and the New Jersey legislature, both Democrats and Republicans, unanimous, without one dissenting vote, enacted the first phase of a 30% across-the-board income tax in New Jersey. Pete DuPont, the former governor of Delaware, was asked, well, can Christy Whitman really pull that off? And he's answered in a Wall Street Journal article, not too long ago, he said, not only can she do it, let me tell you what we did in Delaware. When I was elected governor of Delaware in 1976, the economy in that state was a basket case, just like it is, I might say, in Maine. And over my two terms, we didn't cut the income tax 30%, we cut it 60% across the board. As a result of that, we didn't reduce state revenue. We raised state revenue 36%. We reduced the welfare rolls 40%. We improved the state's bond rating, and the unemployment rate, which was 2% above the national average before the tax cuts, fell to 2% below the national average. And he said 17 years later, just like the Energizer, just like the Energizer rabbit, the economic recovery in Delaware triggered by an income tax cut just keeps going and going and going. The question today, and the question on June 13th is not where we all stand, because I think we all basically agree on the issue. Some of us are a little bolder and more audacious than others, and some a little more cautious. The question is, who can deliver? Who can make it happen? Who can provide the kind of inspirational and persuasive leadership that the next chief executive of this state must provide if we are going to fundamentally change Maine? I'm not running for governor to be a manager, an administrator, a caretaker, or even a moderator. I am running for governor of Maine because that's where the power is to make a positive change in the quality of life in this state. And I ask for your support, and I thank you for being here. I, too, would like to thank uh, you, Al, and the group for allowing us to come today. It's pretty confusing, isn't it? It ought to be. Uh, I've been to all these forums with all these candidates, and they're all great people. And I, I like to tell audiences when I talk to them, but this is not a popularity contest. It isn't a contest of who's the best looking, who's the best speaker, and who um, tells you what you want to hear. Frankly, we're going to have a tough time in November beating Joe Brennan, Angus King, and Jonathan Carter. We've got candidates here who tell you exactly what you want to hear. And I said it earlier, I touched on it earlier, and what I think is really important is before you jump on a bandwagon, you want to know where the bandwagon is going to take you. You've got to find out where it came from. We've got candidates in this, in this group who are advocating cutting taxes, but they want to do away with exemptions, or they want to, uh, oh, six months ago they voted for taxes. We've got candidates who are telling you we get too many welfare programs when they voted for them years ago. We've got candidates telling you that the business climate has to be changed, the environmental regulations are too stringent, and guess what? They voted for them. This is an election 
where we have to field a candidate to run against the old Giza, Mr. Brennan, the new environmental independent, Mr. Mr. King, and the tree spiker, Mr. Carter. Let me tell you something. We've got to field a candidate who can prove that what they're saying today they believed yesterday. And more important, we have to field a candidate who can win, somebody who can draw outside his party. You know, there are those out there who believe if you're not wealthy, if you aren't uh, a businessman, if you didn't go to Harvard, if you aren't a college master degree kind of person, you don't belong in the Republican Party. We have to prove that's not, not the case at all. We have to nominate a candidate who has credentials, who has been pro-business, who can prove that they represent the views of most people in Maine, and who's electable. We need to nominate a candidate who can draw outside the Republican Party. I've been elected to the legislature seven times. One minute. Five of those times were in the Senate district that no Republican should have won. It's a place where a lot of Democrats, a lot of French Catholic Democrats live. These folks, they work for a living, they drive truck, they work hard, they're middle income, and they vote Republican when it comes to the main Senate. They'll vote Republican when it comes to the governor. We need to draw beyond our base. There are things we need to do. We've told you all about them. The tax system's got to be changed. Workers' comp's got to be changed. The environmental regulations in this state are killing us. All these things must be changed. But we need to make sure, and this, the reason we have these forums is so you, the voters, can look and see each one of the candidates and see what we're all about. And I ask you, as you decide who you're going to nominate, that you think about where your candidate will take you tomorrow, because that's really important if we're going to have the kind of state we want in Maine. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the Oxford County Republican Club, and I don't want to hang you. Thank you. <laughs> Not yet, uh, anyway, huh? <laughs> never. And I want to thank you, Al. And being the target of some of the uh, outcries, especially on my right here, I feel a, an opportunity, finally, to uh, vindicate myself. <laughs> and I, I really, and I have to, in a way, I'm not going to apologize, because I don't have a political background. I've only been in politics for three years. Uh, I grew up in Maine. I lived here all my life except seven years when I went to school in Boston where they tried to educate me. Uh, I have a degree in accounting. I have a degree in law. I've started several small businesses. I've had some successes. Some of them have not worked out as well as I had planned. And I don't think we need a governor who's a politician. I firmly believe we need a governor who will be a chief executive officer. I firmly believe that we shouldn't focus, even though it's very important, on who is the one that's got the best chance of beating Joe Brennan or Angus King, because I believe I do. But shouldn't we really focus on who's the best person to do the job, to turn this economy around and put people back to work? And I believe that my background, my education, my experience is the person who can do that job. I'd like to share with you what went on in the legislature this past week, because I think it's indicative of the illness that we suffer from. We passed a franchise bill that would rewrite contracts that the governor fortunately vetoed, and the veto was sustained last night. We debated over a day, a, thank you. We debated over a day a casino bill, which is probably the worst source of economic development I could think of. And yet, I have seen nothing on economic development. Now, Mary Adams suggested some uh, a week or two ago that maybe we ought to put up a sign and say, welcome to New Hampshire, so we can fool people when they come to Maine. <laughs> and I really don't believe that's the solution. And I believe that Maine people deserve more. I have a lot of confidence in the people in the state of Maine. I believe they'll give you the best day for the best pay, and that they work hard, and they produce a premium product. And all we need to do is give them a chance. And if we put together an economic program, and we give the education, and we look globally, and we educate the people into the world's languages and cultures. We can compete internationally, and we can put people to work. But we can't look backwards. We've got to look forward. 
We Thank can't you. look south. We have to look internationally. And I need your help to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all for your interest and patience. Uh, it's a daunting sight to see us lined up, and I'm sure um, I'm sure you've learned some things. But I, I, I will be brief for the, I hope in three minutes because I know you've heard maybe more than you want to hear today. But I want to focus on Oxford County because I think that's that's obviously of interest to you, and it's of interest to, and it reflects a lot of what's going on across the state. We did debate casinos the other day. Casinos would change the landscape of the state forever. I think it would be a tragedy to bring that kind of gambling to Maine. But there was a powerful argument for that casino. Washington County has an unemployment rate of over 15%. When you look at the list, Oxford County is also up there, as are four or five other districts. What we need, what we should have been doing for those six or eight hours, is debating the issue of a statewide strategy to bring jobs to Maine. And I think we have to have very, very specific pieces of that agenda. I think we need to get our fiscal house in order in order to attract job creators to our state. And I, as governor, I would freeze, the, in my first year of governor, as governor, freeze spending. Freeze it, and I would veto a, a budget that had one dime more. I was there when Joe Brennan was spending every dime, every time. You can be sure he'll do that again. We need to do that, and we need to set priorities within that limit so we can reduce our taxes. And I disagree with those who say it's too difficult to do that. I think we can preserve things like education and top priorities. But we need to cut income taxes to send a signal across this country that we're open for business. Otherwise, people just think that we're all sitting back here on our hands enjoying our environment and doing nothing to solicit their business. 18 other states right now are doing that. And if we don't compete, we won't have jobs which pay the revenue to fund education. I will also have a job czar who focuses on that, who tells departments that you aren't going to be protecting your One turf. Minute. You are going to look for jobs for Maine people. I'm running for governor because I'm determined to make this state a place where your children and grandchildren and my children and grandchildren can find a job. And I thank you again for coming today. something today and I urge each and every one of you to pick the candidate of your choice, work with them, work for them, work hard for them, raise money for them, give them money, do anything you can to get your nominee elected in the primary. But after the primary, when one of these eight people wins, we unite and we work together, all of us. Every one of us. And I think you're going to see this year as a real change. There is an opportunity where Republicans could be all over the place. So we need to get that message out and work and work hard. I think uh, all of you should uh, stand and give a round of applause to these people who came all over. This concludes our uh, forum. There are some goodies, coffee, etc. out there, and here's your chance to snag a candidate. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>